So in the last video, we talked about the performance programmability trade-off. And one of the things that I talked about was that in this performance programmability trade-off, there's a bunch of possible architectures you could design. And generally, the more programmable your architecture becomes, the less performant it becomes, or the worse performance becomes. And that a common trade-off in custom hardware design is to reduce the programmability of your architecture. So to sort of, if you think about starting from a CPU, to move backward on the programmability axis and reduce programmability, and in exchange to increase performance, right? So by moving back on the programmability axis, we enable ourselves to move up in the space of possible architectures in performance. So you might be asking, you know, that's a very nice, interesting, illustrative picture, but why does reducing programmability enable higher performance? In other words, why is there actually a trade-off uh, curve between programmability and performance? And to understand this, it can help to look at a simple diagram of a CPU. So here's a simple, uh, you know, kind of block diagram of the functions you might see in a CPU. And if you start up in the top left, a lot of the area in the CPU is dedicated to an instruction cache and a translation look aside buffer to handle the fetching of instructions and to deal with uh, virtual memory accesses. Well, if your architecture has a very simple instruction set, the instruction cache uh, might not need to be as complicated as it is in a more complicated CPU like an x86. Or if your architecture is so specialized that it only runs a fixed function, you don't need an instruction cache at all because the entire instruction set could just be a fixed finite state machine that's hard coded onto the design. And then if you go down, of course, along with the TLB, we've got a page table, which uh, is needed for uh, handling virtual memory. But of course, if your architecture is so simple that it doesn't support virtual memory, there's no need for a page table and you can get rid of that element of the CPU. Similarly, if you go up to the right, you know, typically you'll have an instruction decoder and some storage for the decoded instructions, maybe a, a, you know, a unit to handle exceptions and interrupts. Well, if you have a simpler set of exceptions and interrupts, this logic doesn't need to be as complicated. And if you have a simpler instruction decoder or instruction set, or if your instruction set is just a, you know, a simple fixed finite state machine, as it is in an ASIC, you don't even need to have a decoder at all. And there's certainly no need to have microcode for the decoded instructions, because in the ASIC case, there's no instructions to decode. So there's a lot of different things in the CPU that are really huge area and power consumers that are just devoted to uh, sophisticated control logic to support general purpose programming. And of course, there's a few other things like a floating point unit, which is not actually a control element. But if you think about restricting the range of programs you can write uh, to not include floating point operations, you don't need the floating point unit. And so you've reduced the number of programs the architecture can support, but in exchange, you've uh, you know freed up some area on the chip. The bottom line about this is that when you reduce the programmability of an architecture, um, there are two things that happen. One is that you free up more area on the chip because you've removed control logic, right? So if you don't have a decoder or microcode storage or an instruction cache or a page table, you know that's a bunch of extra area on the chip that you can devote to other kinds of logic like data processing. And the other is that there's less energy overhead per operation because the control logic that orchestrates the computation is simpler. So for example, you know, to execute a program on a CPU, you know, you've got to fetch instructions from main memory, which involves this complicated instruction cache, and you've got to handle accesses to the page table and the TLB to deal with virtual memory, and then you've got to spend a bunch of energy on decoding the instructions and sending them to this, you know, microcode and then retrieving microcoded instructions. And so there's all kinds of hidden control costs when you're designing a CPU, or excuse me, not hidden, but explicit control costs. Um, that raise the energy cost of each computation. And when you reduce the amount of programmable uh, or the programmability of an architecture, the net effect of that is more free area for data processing and less energy overhead for each operation. And so by reducing programmability, uh, you can free up space and energy to do other things that are more computation specific in your specialized hardware. So hopefully that gave you some intuition about how reducing the programmability of an architecture can improve its performance on the applications it can still do. And I'll see you in the next video.